Alien is one of my favorite movies of all time. A horror movie and a sci-fi movie? <laughs> it's two things I love coming together. Like when Led Zeppelin sing about Lord of the Rings. Strider! Or when Haley Williams wears Star Wars clothes. <laughs> Alien was amazing, but I was a little too young to see it in the theater. Technically, I was a little too young to see it when I watched it, but my parents left me home alone with my friends and we had HBO. <laughs> what was I gonna do? Not watch Alien? I regret nothing! The thing is, when I saw it, I knew enough about it going in to know that Sigourney Weaver was the star and that Ripley was the main character. But the people who saw it in the theater didn't know that. I did not know that. Think about it. When the movie starts, you don't know she's the protagonist. It's an ensemble cast and she ends up being the lead, but you don't know that yet. And before you say, so what? She's like the final girl in a horror movie. Well, in almost every horror movie that has a final girl, the final girl is set up as the protagonist right away. We're shown how innocent and good she is, so we're rooting for her. Ripley isn't singled out. She's just one of the crew. We don't even see a human until about five minutes into the movie. We see a title sequence in space where we get a sense of how in the middle of nowhere they are. Then we see shots of the empty interior of the ship, which helps set the tone. The first character we see wake from the sleep pod is John Hurt's character. Maybe the movie's about him. We also focus on Tom Skerritt's character. Maybe the movie's about him. We see all the characters eating breakfast and finding out they've been woken up early to investigate a signal. Yafet Kodo and Harry Dean Stanton's characters start asking about their contracts and how they're going to be paid. Oh yeah, right. Now, I just forgot something, man. Uh, before we dock, I think we ought to discuss the bonus situation. Right. right. Now, I love this because this makes it real. They're real people talking about contracts and money and this is so much better than having sci-fi lingo about the galactic emperor whose name sounds like a prescription medicine like Zalaplex or Quasiplan. This fleshes out the world and makes the characters relatable. You bond with all the characters, not just the one character we're told we're supposed to like. He is the one. Now this is a misdirect, a bit of deception like bluffing in poker. A lesser writer or director, or one who was forced to follow studio notes, would have shown Ripley looking at video of her family back home immediately after waking up from the sleep vault. And of course she'd have a cute kid and a dog, and maybe the kid is sick and that's why she has to work so far from home. Why is this a big deal? Well, it's because it breaks a big Hollywood rule, and one I wish they would break more often. Normally a movie focuses on the protagonist, if not in the first scene, at least in the first 10 minutes. If you don't open on the protagonist, you open with the dilemma and then cut to the person it's going to affect the most. And usually they're a good person who's having a bad day and you just hope they're gonna get a win, and they usually do. But audiences are smart and they're getting smarter. I remember when I was in high school and I wanted to learn about writing, back when I had the crazy dream that I would do this for a living, I'd go to the bookstore and there were a couple of books about playwriting or literature, but as far as TV and movie stuff went, they had Sid Field's screenplay and that's it. And that's it. And that's it. Granted, it was Farmingdale, Long Island in the 80s, so maybe things were better elsewhere, but the point is nowadays there's a billion books on Amazon you could buy about screenwriting, TV writing, not to mention all these YouTube channels. So the information is out there, whether or not you seek it. And even if you don't, audiences have just seen so many movies and a million hours of TV, so they have these story structures ingrained in their brains, even if they don't know what a three-act structure is or have never heard of a red herring. By doing a simple thing like not focusing on Ripley in the opening scenes and showing what a great person she is who has a dream and people who love her, we're already uneasy when things start to go south. We're not sure who to root for. We may not be thinking, hey, they broke a screenwriting rule, but 
instinctively we know something's off because this movie didn't start the way it quote unquote should have. If they had, we know Ripley is going to be the hero and all the other deaths wouldn't have mattered as much. Another movie that breaks this rule, Star Wars. Think about it, we don't meet Luke until about a half hour into the movie. And I'm sure most of you know, scenes with Luke on Tatooine were shot, but were cut from the film because they slowed down the pacing. It showed him looking at the Star Destroyer and capturing the ship that Leia's on, then showed him with Biggs at Tashi Station, who tells him about the rebellion. Then some more of him wasting time with his friends, as Uncle Owen would say. Now, I've read somewhere that Lucas shot those scenes just to appease the studio, and he had no intention of using them, and I'm, I'm glad he didn't use them because the movie got off to a much better start, even though it broke a rule, gotta show the protagonist in the first 10 minutes. And this wasn't done as a misdirect like Alien was. It was more about world building and pacing. And think about it, by the time we meet Luke, we know so much about the galaxy and anything we would have learnt in those scenes, we sum up in a couple of lines of dialogue. So efficiency, baby. There are some movies that take this a step further. And if you haven't seen the movie 1917 yet, skip ahead to the poker talk because I'm about to spoil it. 1917 starts with one character who you think is going to be the protagonist. Then he gets stabbed. You think he can't possibly die. He's the main character. Then he dies. He freaking dies. Moviegoers have seen characters die countless times, but when it's a character you can't imagine is going to die, it hits you so much harder. We know the mentor usually dies, and we know it's probably gonna happen not long before the final battle, and we know parents are doomed in the first reel of a movie, so mixing this up by killing a character you thought had plot armor sends a message that this story is not going to be predictable. So the mission has to be completed by the guy we thought had as much chance of making it to the end of the movie as a red-shirted character in Star Trek checking in an alien planet. This is a huge shock, but it also makes you think, if they killed off the character I thought was the protagonist, maybe this movie won't end the way I thought it was going to. Maybe the protagonist won't complete the mission after all. But then he does. And here's the thing. It's satisfying when he does because we didn't know for sure that it was going to happen. Now, I can't say positively what would have happened if the original character had survived and completed the mission, but my guess is 1917 wouldn't have been as highly praised as it was because it would have come off as a little predictable. Can you do this protagonist switcheroo all the time? No, of course not. If you do it too much, it becomes a trope and then loses all its effect. Now, I play a lot of poker, and if you play against somebody who never bluffs, they become very predictable, and they're easier to read than a Judy Bloom novel. It's like they're folding all night, and then all of a sudden they're betting big. It's like, hmm, what do you have there, foldy locks? And they wonder why nobody calls their bets. You guys playing cards? On the other hand, if you play against those people who always bluff, they may steal a few pots here and there, but eventually they're going to get called and they're going to lose big. Pay him. Pay that man his money. Unless it's one of those nights where they keep getting great cards and then they convince themselves they're really good at poker. And they usually give it all back the next time. It's gone. It's all gone. What do you mean? I, I have a hundred dollars. Not anymore, you don't. Poof. The poker players who end up winning in the long run are the ones who bluff just enough to keep you guessing. And they mix it up from game to game how much they bluff. And that's how a story should be. If every movie opened with a lonely teenager who doesn't quite fit in but goes on to save the day, usually with the help of a piece of wisdom passed on by an older mentor in the first half hour of the film. Yawn. If you break convention slightly, you'll keep people guessing. Like the poker player who bluffs sometimes but not too much. Break convention too much, and in the same way, it won't work either. Like when M. Night Shyamalan did a surprise ending at the end of every movie. 
it stopped working because you were expecting a surprise so you'd spend the first half of the movie trying to predict it and if you were right it didn't work and even if you were wrong you were usually underwhelmed what a surprise and there's one more movie that does the protagonist switcheroo to great effect psycho even if you've never seen the movie you know that one of the most famous scenes in movie history is the shower scene but the reason it scared the hell out of people at the time wasn't just the great music, the great direction, and the great acting. It's because it happened in the point of the movie where it shouldn't have happened. It was akin to a huge bluff in poker from someone you thought never bluffed. I think you're bluffing. Janet Lee is set up as the protagonist of the movie. She's the one we think we're going to be following until the end. Maybe she'll die in the end of the movie, but she's not gonna die in the middle. And then she dies in the middle. It's scary because it used people's subconscious knowledge of story structure against them. No one imagined the star of the movie is going to be killed off so soon. So yeah, following formulas will make for a formulaic story. Knowing that the audience knows the formula means that you could use that knowledge against them. I've been playing in poker games with other writers since the late 90s, and it's not a coincidence that the ones who were better at poker ended up with better writing careers, because both are about deception and not being predictable. So whether you're writing a story or playing Texas Hold'em, bluff every once in a while. They'll never see it coming. I knew it. I knew you were bluffing. I knew he was bluffing.